hi uh, to the 12 people in the crowd to get the friends reference. Hello. Uh, so um, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I think I have something. I'll also get you guys quickly to the break. Don't worry about this. I speak very fast. Whoever is doing the transcription, you're amazing. But uh, it's not going to go well with me. I, do, I speak very fast. Uh, sorry in advance. Uh, so yes, this is the one where I actually talk about boring stuff. Uh, it's stuff we don't really discuss in the community. I'll get to de uh, de in detail about what it is in a while. Also, like Ben mentioned, I'm jet lagged. So there's about two layers of people right now. I, like it's all over the place. So that disclaimer aside. Um, hi, uh, my name's Sunil. I work in Oculus London, as mentioned. Uh, I work with the social VR team really now. Uh, kind of a different org, and I spend most of my day doing React. Uh, I've been with them for about a year now. So sometime about in March last year, John Carmack, the dude behind uh, Doom and so on, uh, who's now the CTO at Oculus, uh, tweeted this. And it turned out to be quite controversial when he did, that effectively a video game company is now starting to adopt JavaScript into part of their stack, which pissed off a lot of people. They're like, there is no way that this could possibly work. Uh, I joined uh, the company about three months after this, so a lot of the hard work had already been done, and I just I, I, I could uh, just get to uh, doing it. So I'm going to quickly jump into my demo. I hope this works, because I've never really done this demo before. So the first product I worked on was something called Oculus Rooms. So you get yourself one of these headsets, and you log into Oculus Rooms, and uh, you get to play games with friends, watch TV, stuff like that. So Let's see if I can. You want to put on the lights a little? Otherwise, I'm not sure it'd be very clear. Okay, let's see. Come on. Okay, can you see? Can you see what I'm seeing? No. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so that's me. So if you look around, it's a nice house. Courtesy of our, art, of our people, uh, art folks, uh, you can go. There's a little games table there where we'll head. There's a TV screen. So let's go to the games table. Uh, and let's just play a game. So chess. Chess in VR, I guess, is usually the first thing most people try. Uh, <laughs> might as well. So hey, look, I'm playing white. And I go ahead. I also get to play the other person's pieces, so haha. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, take that dude. So first off the bat, I'd like to let you know, so all of these are React components. The chest tiles, all the hovers, all of that is React. Uh, there's like no native special integration or anything. They're just little models that are popped into place. Uh, let's get this here. Uh, the pawn does something, but clearly, oh, OK, so <laughs> we could. I could do this forever, frankly. Can we just do this for half an hour and say it's done? <laughs> anyway, so that's Rooms, you guys. That was uh, built in React, and it was, uh, it was pretty sweet. And we launched. Uh, I worked with, on a team with it, and uh, it was really great. I think the biggest part of it was like the iteration speed. That's what we like in React, right? Like being able to do hot reloading, uh, debugging with Chrome Dev Tools. It was pretty sweet. Uh, the way it, wait, let's go back to the slides. So they, the way it works is we have a version of React that we call React VR. Uh, we have an open source version that runs on the web, but internally at Oculus, we use it in our native apps. It's basically React Native, uh, but for this VR surface. I decided to use circles because everybody else uses rectangles, and I want to stand out. Also, it makes React look way bigger than the important bit, which is Unity, which does all the hard work. Um, but yeah, that's mostly it. Like uh, in a in a team where you have different skill sets, there are people who are working on the low level stuff for the 3D bits. Uh, there are art and design; they want to use their own tool chain. But then the React folks come in and say, "Hey, we want to build UIs this way," and we get Flexbox. It's pretty sweet. Uh, I just put this uh, assuming that my demo would fail, but I guess you don't need this anymore. Uh, the next project I joined was Oculus Venues. Uh, Oculus Venues is something we launched earlier this year. Uh, it's live music and uh, stand-up comedy uh, and movies and stuff like that, but in a massive show, a shared social space. Uh, here's a picture of my boss introducing it at OC4 last year. Uh, if you can notice, there are a whole bunch of avatars and 
people playing, and it's in a live stadium. You can actually talk to people, move around. Uh, so this, when it launched in October, everyone was excited and asked when we are going to launch it. So the problem is Facebook does this thing where we, don't, where we share things that aren't done yet. Uh, and we started panicking because it started getting a lot of attention. So we started working on it. Quick picture of my team. I love these people. That's me. That's Mike, Manny, Peter, uh, Taras, Andre. Uh, clearly, we need to work on our gender diversity stats. <laughs> well aware. Uh, but I love these people. Like, it was beautiful. Everybody uh, figures out different roles. This doesn't include the QA and design folks that we have. Uh, the reason I wanted to put this picture is because we were celebrating Pi Day. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we got to work immediately on this. We knew we had a hard deadline. We, need, we wanted venues to launch with uh, when we launched the Go, this device, uh, and we had a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, similar to the previous architecture, we were running React on top of a native layer. Instead of Unity, it's something called VR Shell, which is what Oculus uses. Uh, I think Carmack has spoken about it at a couple of other talks. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, very fancy stuff. It does networking, a bunch of 3D stuff. And it's super efficient, which allows us to do stuff like hundreds of or maybe even thousands of avatars in a social space on a mobile device. This is barely more powerful than like an S7 phone. Uh, should I do a quick demo? Let's try the demo. Uh, let's get into venues. Now, I assume my team's going to be in a venue, so if they say anything rude, please excuse them. Uh, oh, I need to get it. Where did it go? Is it still there? Oh, I'm there. Oh, okay. Cool. So this is venues. It's a whole list of events. Let's go into Sunil's event, which they've set up just for me. Same avatar for, as before. Uh, there's a code of conduct video so just saying, don't be a dick. <laughs> I mean, that's a good, well, good life lesson anyway. Cool, so there's a concert going on, and I'm in my little private lounge. We're trying to get champagne and uh, a buffet set up over here at some point. Uh, but let's go join the crowd. Let's see what's happening. Uh, ta -ta Hey guys, hello. Hi. Are they just worried? Hi. I can click on these people and I get to see them over here. Uh, Ethan is annoying me, so let's just block him. Come on. Sweet. Anyway, so you can hop around, go around places. You can see them. So when a live event is happening, we usually have like hundreds of people. Like everyone's around, and you can. Uh, and yeah, so this is uh, venues, and this is what we launched. It's we get to put banners up there and everything. Thanks for being polite, guys. Um, I also had a video to prove that it actually works, but. Anyway, so we got to work on it. What do we know about the system? Okay, who all are familiar with this statement? This is the E is equal to MC square of UI development, isn't it? Your view is a function of your state. And this is super convenient for us as developers because we know then that we have to write the F, which are components. You pass state to a component and it renders it onto a view. Perfect. Take whatever the view is and write render functions that output it out. Uh, but then how do you actually get state? This also seems familiar to some people, is mark around. Uh, this is the Redux statement, isn't it? Given state and an action, and you run a function over it, it returns you the next state. So in this case, f is reducers, awesome. You now know uh, what to write. You just write reducers for all the actions that are going to be fired down the system. Who generates these actions, though? Uh, it's a pretty core question, and this, is, this goes to the heart of what I actually want to talk about during this talk. Online, on Twitter, or anywhere else, we love talking about libraries and maybe even a cool demo. But it turns out 80% or 90% of your day really is just converting product requirements into code. Right? It's the really boring part. You want to be spending time optimizing performance or putting three flavors of CSS in your JavaScript. Or, but really, this is what pays the bills. 
a product man manager and a designer come up with requirements and you convert it. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a nice E is equal to MC square equation for, the, for this, is it? Like it's fairly generic. Uh, what do these functions even look like? In, in a Java world, for example, because everything is thread blocking and stuff, you can basically make a function that says do this, do this, do this. Uh, it gets really hard in the JavaScript world because everything's asynchronous and you need to synchronize events that are happening in one place and the other. And in VR, it becomes like 10 times harder because there are so many sources of information. Uh, coming in over the network for avatars and how your stadium's re rendering and some HTTP calls to get other stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of sources of information and it gets really hard and we don't really have a formal way of discussing this. Uh, I started looking into answers for this and I found two good leads. Uh, one is this talk by Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure. It's called The Language of the System. Uh, but like most Hitchy, uh, Rich Hickey talks, it's an hour long and you need to like watch it four times to get what he's talking about. <laughs> it's good, don't get me wrong, like I love Rich Hickey, but oh, like, uh, uh, but uh, I didn't even get my answers from this. He talks mostly about the language or the format of data that we pass in between sources. Like how do you know what JSON data means if the information for that is actually out of band, right? Like you can't really tell just by looking at some data what it means. I got a little closer when I started investigating uh, CSP, which uh, is about channels. If any folks have used Golang or Clojure, you know what channels are, but uh, it's, it gets closer to what we want because it has pause and wait, uh, uh, pause, wait, resume semantics that we usually use when we discuss product re uh, requirements. So based off of this, I have decided to invent something. I've, I am now achieving uh, alpha thought leader status with this. <laughs> Uh, it has a very scientific name. I call it the something statements, okay? There are seven something statements, and you should be able to describe all product requirements as a combination of this. Something happened, wait until something happens, do something, do something but in parallel, uh, pay attention to something else that's happening, stop doing something, and read something. So why I like these seven statements is that you can usually find a library that has equivalents for every something statement. You could use RxJS, xState, some library, some asynchronous library that you have. I'm using Redux Saga here, so uh, anyone who's used this knows that you can define these states. So now you're, when, you're, uh, when you get these requirements, you just have to convert them to something statements in a comment block in your code and then just go to town on writing it. Uh, I don't think this hits the grade though. Since this is the JavaScript ecosystem, uh, we need an emoji logo. So the something statements now have an emoji logo, and that means I'm, I uh, get to make libraries and stickers and uh, T-shirts. So I feel like now it's serious, like it's something that I can talk about seriously. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples of how this works. There's no code, but just to ex explain. So you saw venues and you saw me sit next to some people. So nearby avatars makes uh, sense to take care of, especially when you're writing a VR app, because we clearly don't want to track the state for like thousands of users at once. That would make the battery run out in something like 10, 15 minutes. So what we want to do is just look for the people around, the people that you're talking to so that you can get their name labels, find out if they're blocked or not, maybe you want to mute them. Uh, so this is what the product requirements look like for nearby avatars. Uh, anytime an avatar joins or leaves or changes, you run a seat update routine. Uh, and you just broadcast, you tell people that something happened. Oh, somebody joined and he's blocked. And you just broadcast it to other sections of your app. Seat update itself is a separate subroutine where it says every time you call seat update, you store that uh, data in your model, your database, your Redux store. Uh, and if a friend, which is to say, if, you have if somebody joins where you have a one is to one friend relationship, then pop a little toast notification uh, saying that, hey, your friend has joined this pod. By the way, only yesterday I realized why it's called a toast notification, because it pops up. Uh, we don't use toast, well, I don't use a toaster in London. I don't have seen it anywhere else. Do you a toaster still thing? Anyway, uh, another example. The menus, the menus that you saw in the beginning, the list of events and other bits that I've already passed. This actually got really complicated. On first sight, it looks fairly simple, right? If you don't have Wi-Fi, then block. Show a little thing that says, hey, you don't have network, block it. Uh, if your avatar isn't set up, then send them to an avatar editor. Show the Facebook login screen. Hmm. 
uh, get permissions for uh, uh, to share these social preferences. So for example, when you're sitting next to someone and you have something in common via likes, it'll say, hey, the person next to you also likes Aerosmith or something like that. Uh, for me, I put Adam Sandler, but it's because my Facebook profile I haven't updated in like 10 years. And 10 years ago, Adam Sandler was bigger. Uh, <laughs> he isn't very much anymore, is he? I mean, I know he's rich, but. Uh, so yeah, then show the venues list, show the details of the venue. That's a code of conduct video that you want to show at least once per session because we don't want people behaving badly and saying, hey, it's not like you told us to behave well, uh, which is something you have to do on the internet, apparently. Like if you're not told to behave, you just won't. And if all that is good, enter the venue. So this looks fairly simple because it's a step-by-step -step thing. But then the manager comes and says, hey, there's a new requirement. We want to be able to deep link into a venue. Uh, so from the Oculus homepage, we'll put events up, and if you click on that, you want to bypass a bunch of these and go straight to the venue details. You still don't want to bypass the Facebook login if you haven't logged in before. Uh, you uh, we assume that Wi-Fi is working, which is how you manage to click on it. So this single requirement suddenly makes it like really hard to, uh, to deal with. So, uh, uh, but thankfully, because of the something statements, it doesn't matter because it's now a one is to one uh, relationship, unless deep linked into a specific venue is a uh, read data from the model and uh, block until it's, uh, until it's true or whatever. So we started in, we started early in about September last year, I think, and we hacked. We hacked a lot. We went through multiple iterations. Those statements that you saw, imagine like in the tens, maybe close to 100 versions of that for different features. Uh, you will notice that the demo I showed you looked very different from the video that uh, Zuckerberg showed everybody else. He had a flat stadium while we have a little amphitheater setting because based on user testing, we realized that that would be a better thing for users. Uh, we brought in the entire pod concept so that you can sit with your friends. There's a whole private lounge situation. So we iterated. We iterated a lot. We, I don't think I've ever felt so detached about code because we deleted a bunch of stuff and it felt good. It's, I, re I recommend it, like, top three human feelings. <laughs> one, of, one of top three human feelings. Uh, but it, it, that wasn't good enough, and, but we did it in the right order, because once we knew that it was working, we knew that we could make it good. We could start polishing the thing. We could uh, uh, get better assets. We could make sure that everything's moving smoothly, that there are no hidden states in the middle that pops up a spinner for a minute. You might want to put a delay for that. And then once we did that, we did the engineering thing of sitting and making it fast, going piece by piece, making sure we're not reading too much Redux state to generate re-renders. Uh, and not just in the React layer, mind you, even in the native layer, making sure that avatars move smoothly, especially when you're at full capacity. At full capacity, you should be able to see something like 250 avatars around you, everybody chattering away. Uh, it's weird because people use their headsets like at home so you can hear dogs and cats and... <laughs> You, you want, so we, once we saw that, we were like, oh, shit, we need a way to be able to mute the crowd. No, it's not just like the content. So you want, if you want to be watching the content and you don't want to hear a crying baby right next to you, uh, which is what my 10-hour flight from London was like, uh, you, you want controls for that. And then finally, when we did that, we launched in time. It was great. It, you know, pushing something to production and having people use it, where we have metrics showing that it isn't really crashing, Feels good, man. Like, really, I think it's one of the things that we do. And I am, you know, thank you for clapping because I am super proud of the fact that we pushed to production. It could have taken forever. Um, some things about this approach suck. And this is my least prepared slide. I didn't bother making it look nice or anything. It isn't the greatest to test. Redux Saga generators, even though they're really nice to write, it gets really hard to test. Uh, it gets hairy. You might be listening for an event in one place, and then when you make a change, you might forget to remove the block there, so now you have just a dead routine just running forever. Uh, the fact is that it's now bound to a library. Maybe we'll move to like async generators in the future, something a little more native. Uh, the point I didn't put effort into this slide is because it didn't matter. Uh, going back to what I was talking about, the things that we discuss. Uh, if you're on Twitter for any period of time and you're participating in JavaScript Twitter, it makes it feel like if you get one decision wrong, everything's wrong. Uh, if you put your CSS in your JavaScript, well, you're screwed. You've lost 20% of your revenue. And it, 
hey, people say it, right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you don't use the right library or the right approach. But I think the right approach is not to care about that because not only is your code the thing that you iterate on, but in, even on your approaches. At this point, I think we are going to lose Redux Saga by the end of the year. I'm looking forward to putting state machines in. Hi, David. David must be around. Hey. Uh, because I think it's a cooler approach and it solves a bunch of hairy bugs that we had with Redux Saga. Uh, I, we have tests for a bunch of our components and stuff, so I'm doing it a bit fearlessly. That's nice. The fact that I can do that, that we have set ourselves up uh, in a position that we are able to iterate. And uh, that's what I want to impress on the rest of you right now. A lot of people will tell you what is right or wrong, but all of those things really don't matter when you're in production because you launched and it worked. I mean, we could have renamed all our variables to use Devanagari script, and it still wouldn't have mattered. It would have meant that we have to do a whole bunch of things to get the transpilation of the code right. My point is that that order of steps to get it to work first has to be like super precious to you. That it's something that you spend time on to figure out how to get something to work. The actual code is something that you can change any point of time. Maybe we'll ditch React after a point. Uh, maybe, we, maybe, maybe I'll finally learn some C++ or C Sharp and actually write native code. All, all I really want is Flexbox, but. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I don't have much else of a talk. I just hope that you start looking at the way that you do code and ignoring thought leaders on Twitter the way I do. <laughs> Thanks, Yuta. Uh,